Yeah, I'm Rick Lencioni. Uh, I served with the 101st Airborne Division during the Vietnam War. I was a platoon leader and a company commander in the 501st Airborne Infantry Regiment. Okay, and can you tell me the first time you met Richard uh, Flaherty? First time I met Richard, uh, if I recall correctly, we were on an operation together. We were both platoon leaders. Uh, we were actually in separate companies at the time, but for some reason we were doing this joint operation together. And um, I met Richard uh, during the time that we actually went into a little bit of a stand down in the operation. We had moved into a village, and the two of us were talking to each other about strategy, what we were going to do that night as far as setting up. We had actually fought our way into that village, and so we had a lot of dead North Vietnamese lying around at the time. Uh, we didn't have any serious American casualties from that action, but I got to know Richard a little bit from that. Was there sort of a general consensus with other leadership at that time of which direction to go, or was it just kind of in each leader's hands on whether we're taking prisoners or...? You had life and death control over everything around you, even as a young officer. Uh, Richard and I were probably close to the same age at that time. I was 21. I'm assuming he was about the same age at that time or close to it. And when you're out there, you're separated from your command structure. And we didn't even have a company commander over us at that time. We were both platoon leaders. But the company, the company commanders involved were off with other platoons doing other things. So in our area, uh, we controlled life and death over everybody around us. And we, we obviously had a, a lot of very heavily armed young men with us. Uh, average age over there is about 19 years old. So you might have 30 plus men uh, young boys actually walking around with all kinds of weaponry and all you had to do was point and say shoot and they would shoot So that's why I say you had the total life and death control and nobody was going to second-guess you If you if somebody was killed they were killed and then you moved on so, so at that time were you kind of almost autonomous that you were gathering your own intelligence planning your own missions or Was there a general mission? We would have a general mission. They tell us they want us to move to a certain objective and we would uh, basically plan how we were going to do, th do that. Uh, a good senior officer over us would not try to tell us step by step how to do it. He would just say, that's your objective. We need you to uh, take that objective by such and such a time. And then we would plan how we're going to get there and how we're going to accomplish that mission because we're on the ground, we're actually in the terrain, and who better to make those decisions than the person that's actually there? You know, rather than somebody flying around in a command and control helicopter, you know, a thousand feet above you. So, so at that same time, you and Richard are second lieutenants. First, I was the first lieutenant. I don't know what Richard was at that time. He was a lieutenant. Okay. I didn't know his exact rank. We didn't wear rank on our uniforms because we, we knew the guys that were with us knew who we were. We, they knew us to be the officers, but we didn't want the enemy to know we were the officers. So it was smart not to wear your rank. What, what would you, uh, an officer, wear that would give it away? Uh, you wear your, your tennis bar on your collar or on your helmet, uh, on your camouflage cover on your helmet. And, you know, sometimes I had that on, but there were times that, it, uh, you know, the uniforms would rot off your back. So if the, that uniform jacket rotted away, you'd call in for a uniform jacket. It wouldn't come out with your name on it and your rank on it. It'd just be another, another jungle, jungle fatigue jacket. And you'd throw that on. And I got chewed out for that one time by a brigadier general who flew out there and shoot me out to, because I didn't have any rank insignia on. And I told him straight to his face, I said, sir, I don't need anybody else to know who I am, what my rank is. These guys around here, they know who I am. That's the only people I want. And then I told him, I said, if I were you, sir, we've been in, in running battle for basically several hours. So this was on and off through the night before and into that day. I said, if I were you, sir, I said, I'd get back in that helicopter and leave because he was standing around with his star on his helmet and on his uniform, and he's all starched up. He looked perfect for a brigadier general, but he's also a big target, so it was good to get him out of there. At that time, uh, when you were just accomplishing your missions, do you remember having conversations with Flaherty? And some of oh, yeah. There were several times that he and I had conversations uh, uh, when, when we would operate in the same general area uh, because we'd be communicating on either the battalion net where we'd set up a, an inter platoon net where we could talk to each other, uh, even if we weren't physically right with each other. So we coordinate the operation. As far as his men go, the people that were in his platoon, and I would say probably from the platoon sergeant right on down, I don't know that they would ever talk back to him. He wasn't the kind of officer that was going to take much bullshit. 
And I, and I believe they respected him a lot. I mean, I talked to guys that were in Richard's platoon, and I've never really heard them say a bad word about him. Right. But of course, you know, as I told you before, he had that total control. We all had that control of life and death over everybody. That included our own people. You know, it wasn't just the enemy. I mean, if somebody in our unit did something that got, that warranted him getting killed, it potentially could result in a lot of people looking the other way. Yeah. So if the platoon leader is that strong, and Richard was that strong, and he decided, hey, this guy's a danger to all of us, and they agree, who knows what happens. Yeah. Sometimes put them in a situation where they're at higher risk. Yeah. And that certainly happened. I think a lot of us uh, were put in that situation where we said, eh, you know, this guy needs to get a little bit of the shine off of him. You know, get him out there and let's hit, let's make him earn his keep a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes the best thing you can do for him because if these guys don't learn how to survive out there, usually we would say, you know, if you make it through your first 30 days, you're probably okay. I mean, bad luck can kill you, but the first 30 days when you're going to make a lot of your mistakes that are going to get you killed, and then the last 30 days, because you're anxious about going home, you make mental mistakes, and it gets you killed. But the 10 months in between, you got a chance as a combat soldier. Wow. You know, you're experienced enough, but you're not too nervous yet about going home. Yeah. And there was, a, there was a battle once you overheard on a radio with Richard's platoon. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember the dates and times? or the, the It was... Uh, it was uh, I want to say it was probably in the late summer of 68, and I was listening in on the battalion net. Uh, you know, you had different radio nets. You had a company net, you had a battalion net, a brigade net. But I'm listening on a battalion net this night, and a recon platoon, which Richard was commanding at the time, had come into contact with a large NBA force, which was, I don't know if we ever really determined how big the force was, but it was a lot larger than, than his recon platoon. They had set up a defensive perimeter, and they were being attacked all night long. The NVA, their purpose was to overrun them, to basically kill every one of them. And nobody ever had it in their mind that they were going to surrender. So, and I can guarantee you, in Richard's platoon, that was not a thought that anybody would have. They're not going to surrender. And the fight be began, and they fought all night long. They fought with everything they had. Uh, a lot of them were, became casualties. In fact, I think uh, probably the majority of the platoon was some type of casualty, either killed or wounded. But in the morning, they came out of it. And uh, the ones that were left, that were still able to fight, had fought all through the night. Um, they killed, I don't want to say 100, but probably close to that of North Vietnamese were killed in that engagement. There was a big pile of NVA dead around them, but they were still there. Yeah. And Richard commanded that whole thing. Nobody could get to him. They couldn't get to him to relieve him. I don't remember the reasons why that we you know we couldn't helicopter in. We may not have had the aircraft to do it, or you know for whatever reason, we couldn't get a relief force in there. And he was told to hold position till morning, and he held it. How many people do you think he had that day and under his platoon, from where to where could have been? How many people did he have in his platoon? Yeah. Well, platoons at that time, because of casualties, could go from as few as uh, 15 to 18 up to a maximum strength of about 30, 34, 35. But my guess is at that time of the year, uh, because of all the fighting and everything, he, he might have had 25. And the average of rifle platoon was usually down to about 25. You couldn't keep them full. Those 25 guys, what type of weapons were they carrying out in the bush at that time? We, you carried the same things we all carried. Uh, M16, uh, which is a semi-automatic and full automatic rifle. Uh, the M79 Thumper grenade launchers. Uh, two M60 machine guns. Uh, he probably did not carry a recoilless rifle. Uh, they carried uh, the law, light anti-tank weapons, the disposable, you know, shoot and throw away type weapons, uh, claymore mines, that you put around your defenses, perimeters at night, grenades, uh, fragmentation grenades, smoke grenades, white phosphorus grenades, C4 explosive. Um, pretty much standard infantry issue at that time. But you were a powerful force because every guy that carried an M16 probably carried five or six hundred rounds of ammunition for that thing easily. You know, so to, the last thing you ever want to do is run out of ammunition. 
and I'm sure that night he was probably getting close to it. Do you know if there were any airdrops put brought into him? Well, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I heard nothing on the net that night that indicated he was getting any form of relief. And they, they couldn't have done an airdrop into a tight perimeter like that. You'd probably be giving it to the North Vietnamese. You know, you can't, you can't be that pinpoint accurate on an airdrop. Richard also told me that uh, when he originally arrived, I think he said he was in um, Wei Fubai or the, the big airport. Um, yeah, Fubai. Fubai. That he was originally, but it was getting rocketed really bad, and then they were sent, I don't know if it was north to Tet. So actually, no, he was he was with us. He was in Kuchi. We were at the air. It, it, they flew us out of the airfield at Kuchi during when Tet happened, and we flew north to Fubai. And that's near Way. That's very close to Way. Uh, I can't remember the distances, but I'd say within 10 miles of, of the city of Way. And Way was uh, was um, under assault by uh, two North Vietnamese and uh, one Viet Cong regiment. So there were probably about 12,000 enemy troops in Way at that time. And uh, it was the early days of Tet. The Marines were in there trying to fight. Elements of the 101st had gone up in there to to help out too. But Marines carrying most of that fight. You didn't see Richard up in that fight because you guys were no. Off to everybody was scattered when Ted when Ted happened. Uh, the balloon went up everywhere, you know, because yeah. everybody was engaged. The Second Brigade of the 101st Airborne, which Richard and I were part of, uh, they deployed us north. Uh, and they put us under operational control of the First Cavalry Division, so we operated under the First Cav probably from uh, January, mid January, all the way until um, April because we hadn't moved the division headquarters forward yet. Division headquarters was still down south. And when division headquarters came forward, they basically took command of all the 101st Brigades, which there were three, and started controlling the operations of all three brigades. What was your responsibility in a way, which would have been similar to Richard's? What were you guys exactly doing? We were operating around the outskirts of the city of Way. We were trying to cut off escape routes for the North Vietnamese. Uh, actually, a pretty large contingent of them escaped across the river. They blew the bridge. Uh, there was a, a, a big bridge that came out from the citadel that went back over to like the mainland area. And uh, North Viet Vietnamese regiment wanted to use that to escape. And they uh, got quite a number of them out and blew the bridge behind them so that uh, they figured you know, Americans won't pursue. But we were pursuing. And we actually spent probably close to the next 30 days pursuing large North Vietnamese units that had come out of the Battle of Way and other cities, uh, other towns around there. Uh, we got in a very big battle in the city of Hai Lang. And there was a North Vietnamese battalion, actually, in Hai Lang. And that was, that was probably the first major battle that the 2nd Brigade engaged in. It actually was the 501st Airborne Infantry that engaged in it. We had a full battalion into there, and uh, North Vietnamese had a full battalion in there. When you were in Hue, uh, did you remember large casualties on your side, or was it? Yeah, we were taking casualties every day, every day, every night. You know, when we first got to Vietnam, they gave us a briefing, and they said, well, you know, you might see the, the enemy once every couple weeks or something like that. You know, you may, you may not see them for long periods of time. Well, I don't know if they were talking to the infantry specifically about that, but there wasn't as much activity at that time. If you go back into history, uh, they'll tell you that w we were reporting that we were winning the war and that you know it was almost over. Well, then the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong launched the Tet Offensive. Well, the Tet Offensive was intended to get the South Vietnamese to basically turn to the north and say, "Okay, you know we're going to rise up with you and and." rebel and throw these Americans out and take over. But that isn't what happened. What ended up happening is the Viet Cong got destroyed. And it was never really a major force after that. Again, it was North, mostly North Vietnamese fought that and local Viet Cong, but never main force Viet Cong again. But um, the, the casualties were high. And the reason the casualties were high was because there were so many North Vietnamese and Viet Cong around at that time. For that first 30 to 60 days after Tet, those big units were still around. They hadn't scattered yet. And uh, so you were either contacting them or they were contacting you every day and every night. You had ambushes out every night. You had your ambush operations out there. Uh, usually every company would put out at least three ambushes, sometimes four or five ambushes. 
So you, you had constant opportunities for contact. And very seldom did you go through a night at that time where you didn't make contact because they were trying to move around. They were trying to escape. You know, they're trying to get the hell out of Dodge. And they got all these American units chasing them. The you know, 1st Cavalry and 101st Airborne up there, they weren't, you know, just up there to, you know, take their names down. We were out there to kill them. And we were very aggressive in our operations. Do you remember anything about Richard ever losing any of his men? And um, and Richard had several casualties. Right. It was just constant. I mean, all of us did. I don't know if he lost more than others right. or not. He was a very aggressive officer. So there's a chance that he would have lost more people because he was very aggressive and moving to contact to, to engage the enemy. Um, but I can tell you that his men didn't rebel against him for that because they trusted him. I mean, he was, a, he was a tough little prick, but they like tough little pricks when you're in combat. Yeah. They don't want that, you know, milk toasty guy that says, gee, I really don't know what we should do today. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, and, he, he, Rick knew what he was doing. Well, you respect, you respect the hard ass, yeah. you know, because that's who you want next to you when fighting starts. You don't want the, the little weak guy that can't make decisions and is not aggressive. Yeah. You want somebody like that. You, you also went to the same uh, Special Forces training camp, not a different time yeah. as of Richard, but just to give me an example of the physicality of it when you went through it, can you kind of picture how Richard at his size, like if you can tell me some of the things physically you did in the boot camp that would have been certain challenges for a man his size? Well, Richard went through Special Forces training after he came back from Vietnam. I went through Special Forces training before I went to Vietnam. But it would have been the same type of program. Uh, it wouldn't have been any different. The only difference between somebody like me and somebody like Richard is the height issue and how much you can really carry. So physically, you've got to be able to ha handle the, the fact that you're carrying all this munition and you got to take your rucksack, you know, you got to jump your parachute, you got to do all this kind of stuff. That's a lot of weight to carry. You're going to exit an aircraft in a Special Forces training operation. Uh, you're going to be carrying generators, you're going to be carrying weapons, you got your parachute system. So you'd be jumping anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds easily. You know, so that's a lot of stuff to carry. When you're only four foot nine, it's that much harder to carry that. In fact, his, his rucksack, which you strap down below your reserve parachute, it had to be close to hanging on the ground. For him to get out of the aircraft, with his rucksack down here on his shins, that's pretty tough to move. You know, the rest of us, it was maybe at our knees, but he, he would have had it down close to his feet. But, so it's physically harder for him to do that. But I would have never even questioned his ability to do it because just from the standpoint of who he was, I mean, he's just tough, so right. he could do it. And, and you did some hand-to-hand -hand fighting training? and. Oh yeah, I mean, it's just standard Special Forces training. You actually start that when you first go in the military. It's how far you want to take that. Uh, you know, if Richard may have taken a higher level of hand-to-hand -hand training than I took just because he went in after the war. For me, when we went into Special Forces, um, I want to say that they, they gave us all of the, the training but we didn't necessarily have the time to move on to the more specialized training, which would have been advanced hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques and things like that, because uh, we were going, everybody knew they were going to Vietnam. Everybody knew that. So they were getting you ready for that. But it was an advantage for me, personally, to have had Special Forces training before I went, because uh, conventional Army troops, Richard would be included, were not necessarily trained uh, heavily in night operations and uh, patrolling and ambush techniques and all that. They got some training, but they didn't get the intense training that you got in Special Forces. So he would have got a lot of that when he came back and, and went into Special Forces. If you can just give me a brief summary of uh, Special Forces or Green Beret, what's the difference between him and a, and a conventional soldier? The mission is totally different. Uh, Special Forces troops are trained to operate always in enemy territory, always in enemy. You're never, you don't have a front line. Uh, the actual mission of Special Forces is to infiltrate into an area, whether by air, sea, or land. You know, you infiltrate into an enemy country. Uh, you recruit uh, indigenous personnel. 
from that country to fight with you. You can recruit, uh, you're expected to recruit up to a regiment, which would be about 1,500. 12, number 12 man Special Forces 18 recruits up to 1,500. You train them, you, you secure weapons for them, usually by resupply from outside. Secure weapons, you train them in the weapons, you train them in tactics, uh, and then you're to conduct operations with them against the uh, government and government troops of that area. That's what Special Forces actually does. So you're a guerrilla. Uh, by our terms, you would probably call us terrorists because we were terrorists and trained terrorists. So that's what Special Forces really is. Uh, conventional troops don't operate that way. Uh, they're not trained to do anything like that. Uh, it's more straightforward type of combat training. And they actually have front lines and they have base camps and they have uh, infrastructure. Special Forces A team doesn't have a whole lot of infrastructure. It's them and what they call the SFOB, which is Special Forces Operating Base. And that's what they communicate with. So if, if Richard would have gone with me, if he was alive today and he would have gone with me and he would have came here, what do you think would have happened if he was here at this event? Oh, wow. I can't even imagine. <laughs> I can't, I guess, I mean, you know, he and I communicated back and forth a couple times uh, over maybe the last 10 years. Uh, he would send me letters and I would send him a note back, you know, a little back and forth. But he wanted me to come see him and I never went down to see him. Because he'd say, well, you come out to Miami and we'll hang out, we'll do this, you know. And I never really went down there because I still had kind of a, you know, I don't know about Flaherty stuff, you know. Because right. <laughs> I always thought he was a little on the edge. You know, and I thought, well, I don't know if I'm going to go hang out with Flaherty again because we weren't always on the friendliest of terms. But if he would come here, I would certainly enjoy talking to him again because um, we, I think we've all had situations where you got on the bad side of somebody or you had a dispute over there in, in, during the war and then you run into that person 20 years later and things have totally changed. I actually had a battalion commander come up to me that, that I used to butt heads with all the time. 20 years later, he comes up to me at a reunion here and apologizes to me for the way he acted. I know, what was that about? You know, I was going, wow. And Richard probably would have the same thing. I'll tell you, he'd draw a crowd. Yeah. Richard would draw a crowd uh -uh. because uh, it, it, people would recognize that little guy there and they go, oh, I remember him, even if they weren't in his unit. Because if you talk to people that were in the 501st Infantry, and you just mentioned Richard Flaherty. Every once in a while, you run into a guy who goes, yeah, I remember him. He was that little officer who was over in Charlie Company. Or he was that little recon platoon leader. They didn't know him, but they knew of him. Yeah. Now, whether they said that about me, I doubt it. Yeah. But everybody knew Richard. He stood out. He would have been a star here. Yeah. yeah. Any, any idea why you think he reached out to you 10 years ago? It's kind of a weird thing you guys never... I'm not even sure how he found me, to tell you the truth. He might have talked to somebody that knew me, and he said, Rick's up in Tampa. Oh, but geez. what do you think his motivation was? It might be one of those things, like a lot of us get, where we say, oh, you know, we want to make, make the wrong things right. Yeah. You know? Get over it. Make peace, yeah. Yeah. Get over it, make peace, and that's it. Yeah. You know, I don't have any animosity to people anymore. I've, I've, I've had disputes with some other officers, for example, at the, due to what I didn't like about them during the war. And in most cases, uh, we've worked it out.